you for joining us for our next episodes in Archaeologists in Quarantine. My name is Natasha, and today I am joined with a few special guests. First, we have Dave Parham, who is a professor of maritime archaeology at Bournemouth University. And we have Zihad Morsi, who is an Egyptian maritime archaeologist and PhD student at Southampton University. We are awaiting uh, our third guest, which is Dr. Maddy McAllister, who is currently in Australia. So due to the time zones, we may have to just do a separate live stream. So apologies in advance. Okay. So hello, we're live. How are you both? Uh, fine, thank you. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm actually really excited for this. I've been waiting a long time to do maritime archaeology. So it's going to be a good one. Okay. okay. So I think first things first, let's get straight into it. What is maritime archaeology? Who would like to go first? Dave? Internet a little bit. Ah, the archaeology of man's seafaring, sea, the archaeology of man's sea for women's seafaring past. So any aspects of seafaring which can be shipwrecks or ships or dock installations or the archaeology of seafarers, relevant trade and exchange, relevant warfare. So really, it's it's the archaeology of man's use of the sea. Is my reading of it. Mm. And Ziha, do you have anything to add? No? So apologies everyone, we have slight technical issues today with the Wi-Fi, the joys of Zoom now, everybody's using it, so it's okay. So uh, Ziha, anything you'd like to add in regards to the definition of maritime archaeology? Well, I always like the definition that maritime archaeology, it's all the relationship or interactions between human beings and any water body. Um, maybe mainly because I'm, I'm focused more on the rivers uh, side of things. So uh, that's why I'm keen on um, putting it as a general um, uh, definition of maritime archaeology. So all interactions between all the human beings, either now or in the past, uh, with water uh, or any kind of water body, um, including oceans, rivers, lakes, um, and um, uh, even seas. Um, hmm. That's great. And I've noticed whilst I was just Googling, just to see what would be definitions of maritime archaeology. I noticed there was a lot of other terms used like nautical archaeology and underwater archaeology. Are they sub-disciplines or are they the same? Dave? They're all over it. Um, really maritime archaeology is the term used now but you've got underwater archaeology being archaeology conducted underwater Nautical archaeology, the archaeology of ships, uh, marine archaeology, the ar you know the archaeology in the sea. There's all, all all sorts of definitions, and whoever you speak to, you'll get a different answer. But the current term really is maritime archaeology. Hmm, that's good. So I've noticed as well online, and this is quite interesting. There is a difference between commercial and maybe more research and maritime archaeology? Or are they kind of incorporated together? What would you say? Um, commercial as in archaeology related to development hmm. rather than marine salvage. Because there's really commercial, commercial archaeology is in archaeology related to development as it's done in the UK isn't any really any different to research archaeology. The techniques are the same. Um, the aims may be different in that commercial archaeology would be mitigating the development of a port development, for example, whereas research archaeology may be being conducted to answer a, a specific question, although they can both, they can both work, work that way. Um, there's also marine salvage, which is the salvage of goods for profit, which is nothing to do with archaeology, but is sometimes uh, conducted on archaeological sites. Hmm. Zihad, is there any difference in how well, commercial yeah. is in Egypt? 
Well, in Egypt until now, we don't have any commercial archaeology at all, uh, either terrestrial or underwater. Uh, all, um, all archaeological work being conducted in Egypt are done within an, a research institution or in a collaboration with the Ministry of uh, Tourism and, and Antiquities. Um, so everything here um, is done under the um, umbrella of the Ministry of uh, and Tourism and Antiquities. Uh, so we don't have any uh, commercial underwater archaeology at all in Egypt. I'm actually surprised by that. Yeah. That's really interesting that they're... I think it's a shame because I think by having commercial archaeology in general, I think it does uh, help because obviously we're part of planning permission in the UK and, and definitely in Europe as well. I, I know that in other countries and other continents, it's not the same situation, which I think is quite sad. I think it would help a lot of institutions if they had the possibility to have more protection rights. Yeah, yeah, that definitely uh, it will. And also it will help in um, raising some funding to uh, keep those in institutions in operational. Uh, uh, so some institutions in, in Egypt, we actually have only one institution who does underwater archaeology or maritime archaeology, which is in Alexandria University. Um, I've been working there uh, for seven years before uh, moving to Southampton to, to do my PhD. Um, and we were we are the only institution in North Africa doing underwater archaeology and maritime archaeology, uh, other than the Ministry of uh, Antiquities. Um, so yeah, uh, maybe in the future, but until now, the Egyptian law doesn't permit any kind of uh, commercial um, archaeology work, either on land or underwater. Um, but who knows? Maybe in the future, the law would change. Yeah, it's quite a new it's quite a new thing in the UK um it's perhaps well new 25 years old the mid 90s was when um commercial archaeology as as we know it took off until then any development really had any sort of archaeological component to it so there was you know, and and wrecks were found or other things were found and routinely destroyed but since the mid Mid nineties, it's formed a much closer part of the of the planning regime. So now, any any offshore or marine development as as archaeology is part of that, which has been a good thing. I mean, it's meant that sites have been found and they've been protected, and it's it's created um, a larger sector with more expertise and more opportunities for people working within it, which has been good. A lot of that has been concentrated on survey and the avoidance of archaeology. So. Um, while terrestrial archaeology development-led terrestrial archaeology has resulted in a, a lot of excavations of sites and increases of knowledge, the same thing really hasn't happened in in the marine world, mainly because it's easier to avoid sites um, and not have to deal with the considerable costs related to them than it is to um, to excavate them and deal with them. So they they, they usually left and preserved where they are then excavated. How does that work in Egypt then? So until now everything goes uh, through the ministry. So the ministry, um, if any kind of, any company needs to uh, um, get a permit to work in any um, any of the national waters, uh, they have to apply for a permit from the ministry and then the ministry would send um, um, Inspectors of underwater archaeology to go with the uh, with the with the company. Um, yeah. Uh, so that that that's by law they have to do it uh, um, this way. The same uh, in terrestrial archaeology. If um, a contractor needs to build a building, a new building, um, they have to go to the Ministry of Antiquities to get permits that these lands are clear from any archaeological remains. It's the same, um, uh, but. Yeah, um, everything had to go centralised, had to go through the ministry um, okay. in Cairo. I mean, it's, but, it, it's the same here that there's a curatorial process where yeah. where planning uh, planning and development goes through either 
county archaeology so more typically in the marine zone um, it'll go through national so historic england or historic scotland um so it's the same kind of thing but, but we have an industry here um of archaeological consultants that that take on that that kind of work but all yours is done directly with with government staff is it yeah yeah there is um um, um Apart from the uh, part of the Ministry of Antiquities in Alexandria, uh, the Department of Underwater Antiquities, um, uh, they are um, um, the ones responsible for all the work uh, uh, happening in the water in, the, in around Egypt, not just in Alexandria. Uh, but their main um, uh, place is Alexandria. They are based in Alexandria. Yeah, uh, they have branches in the Red Sea. Uh, on the Nile and also on the north coast. Uh, okay. Yeah. So everything should go through them, um, and they would send inspectors uh, with the mission, either if there is a foreign mission working uh, in a site, an underwater site, they would be accompanied by um, some inspectors from the ministry, or if it's an oil and gas uh, company or a new development, coastal development, they would send uh, a team of the underwater inspectors to go and check the site before any uh, kind of disturbance or work. Being okay, done. so they find much then? Yeah, yeah. And what's the usual outcome from that? Is it avoided or is it excavated? So or most, most of the time it's, it's avoided um, yeah. because uh, working in underwater, you know it's, it's, a, it's a, a very costly uh, work and yeah. so it's always being avoided especially the underwater um, avoiding the um, clusters of either shipwrecks or sites um, and then uh, renegotiating with the urban development to either move or do a, some kind of barrier around the site so yeah most of, most of the time it's being um, moved to other location. Okay, yeah, the, uh, that, that, it seems to be the same sort of approach in the UK. I don't have, I mean, it's a long, I used to work in commercial archaeology, but that was 20 years ago. It's probably changed a lot since then. I mean, we, we do, or we used to find things occasionally, more often than not, we didn't. Um, and more often than not, the sites were voided, as you said. There's been, a, there's been a, only a handful of excavations have occurred as a result of it, which is a bit of a pity, really. Uh, the most recent being the, the recovery of a Barracuda, Second World War Barracuda aircraft mm. uh, close to Portsmouth last summer, um, a type of aircraft that was quite important in the Second World War but doesn't survive as a working air airframe. So, you know, things do, do turn up and are dealt with occasionally. And how much does it cost? Because you both said it's quite costly. I mean, I can imagine, but generally... It's expense, like... yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the, the biggest cost, or about 50% of the cost, is the conservation of the material that you find. So um, we've just been doing a large excavation of um, HMS Invincible in the Solent, and our running costs on site were somewhere between five and a half to six and a half thousand pounds a day. And that was the staff and the boat and accommodation and... And equipment and our our conservation costs for the project are probably in the region of a quarter of a million so you know it's significant cost much more than working on a beach for example and the big the biggest difference being your you're paying for the infrastructure the barges the, the diving equipment the staff numbers are the same but you've got all this infrastructure around them and you've only got a, a limited amount on on them on site to date that's at the expense end of it if you're doing much smaller things you're still into a few thousand pounds a day so you know it's an expensive going to see in any description is an expensive game and maritime archaeology has to has to meet all of those costs mm. has he had any idea how much it would cost in egypt i'm assuming it must be around the same well yeah it would be a, so it depends if if you own your own equipment uh, so you, you would start somewhere. Um, so basic equipment, you would have your 
personal diving gear, four diving gear for each member. And then you have a couple of compressors, a couple of Zodiacs or a small, uh, or a small boat. Um, if you have all of this, then the operational cost would be a bit low uh, uh, comparing to hiring everything or working on a large uh, boat or a barge. Uh, so it depends on the site also. Um, and it, it depends on what you are going to do with the with the site. So normally the surveys would be much much cheaper because you don't um, there is no cost for um, uh, bringing the the archaeological remains up or conserving them. So all these um, uh, costs would be less. Uh, so the survey would cost some kind of like around. I would say around maybe 10,000 10, pounds in, uh, a week, a week, if, if you're working within. So if you are in the Red Sea, for example, for a week, uh, renting a boat or a safari boat and working from this boat as the main um, uh, hub, uh, it would be around 10 to 15,000 pounds per week uh, for operational costs. Um, uh, fridge pounds, not a kitchen pounds. Um, but for smaller surveys, would be maybe so I would say 25% of this number uh, would cost for a, a survey that you have all the equipments ready. Um, you have your own boat or a zodiac or a rep, and you have all the equipments um, there, and then you would. Um, as we do, we just camp on the beach and we would go every day um, uh, with a small uh, zodiacs to the, to the location or to the site. That sounds really cool. I mean, I don't know how it would be, but it does sound amazing to be able to camp on the beach and then go um, for a dive and, oh, that sounds amazing. <laughs> I actually did my diving course in Egypt. I was down in, I went down to Dahab, yeah, and I did my paddy qualifications there. I mean, it was either that or a swimming pool Yeah, <laughs> in no, the UK. No. I think Egypt's definitely the best place to learn. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. Dahab, Dahab is one of the really most famous diving sites in Egypt. And it's, it's really cool to go there and dive. Yeah. Amazing. So you both mentioned again about the costs. So how do you get investors or how are universities able to do these projects? I'm guessing there's grants and things like that available, but. There's grants, you, you raise money from, you know, charitable trusts, uh, people that want to do donate money. That, that's our experience of it. Some of it's done, so, some work is funded by the heritage agencies in the UK. And if it's, if it's development led archeology, span uh, because somebody's building a port, the developers of the port would be, would be paying for that. So it's, it's not, um, it's quite a hard ask to raise money of that sort, because it, it, it's, it's into the hundred thousands and the millions to, to do a large project. Mm. So it's, it's, it's not something that happens every day. We have a question from Hussan. Thank you for your question, Hussan. Um, is there any coordination on data analysis between subsea mapping for commercial work such as oil and gas and archaeology? In, in the UK, okay, um, they would have to, before any, any work of that sort occurred, they'd have to do an archaeological survey. So that data would be archaeologically assessed and a lot of that is housed with, with the hydrographic office, which makes it um, accessible, publicly accessible, or some of it is. How, how that's done elsewhere, I don't know. I'd be interested to see what the Egyptian hmm. picture is. Yeah, we, sadly, we, we don't have this because by law they are not. Um, um, it's only if the development uh, uh, and the inspectors who are um, going there to the site and inspecting find an archaeological site, then they would do the whole reporting um, and add it to the database. But um, with the, especially with the offshore and oil and gas industry, um, there is no um, 
direct link between the Ministry of Antiquities and the, the offshore um, industry. Uh, so it's only by uh, personal communication with an, an engineer on an oil rig who's doing uh, a swath bathymetry somewhere in the Mediterranean, and then he or she finds a, a target, and then they would send it to the ministry and say, look, we find this, here is the coordination, here is the, the coordinates of the site, and here is the some sample of the footage. But until now, sadly, we don't have um, bigger communication between the two industries. Um, but we've, we're hoping in the future would would have more of this collaboration between the research and then the ministry and also the, the offshore oil and gas industry uh, in the country. Because now Egypt is opening up, opening up more of its national waters for uh, uh, deep sea exploration for the uh, oil and gas industry uh, within the Red Sea. So there is a need for this kind of collaboration um, in the time being. But so far, there is not much happening. And it's not guided by, uh, by the national legislation. Also. In the UK, it's a bit different because there is the legislation for it. But in Egypt, um, they, there is no legislation for this. Yeah, there was a big boom to um, archaeology in the UK from historic oil and gas survey data, where um, surveys done in the North Sea were subject to archaeological um, analysis and interpretation. And I've told us a lot about, not, not about the shipwrecks, but about the, uh, the land surfaces that occurred before the, the North Sea was inundated and brought up the whole the whole concept of dogger land and terrestrial land surfaces in the North Sea, which was based around historic oil oil and gas industry data. So where it's been collected at that level, you know, if it's available, it can, it can tell you a lot. And of course, it's already been, the, the expensive bit, which is the collection of it, has already been done. So in that case, it's a, it's a matter of analysis and interpretation and not, and not, data collection there. So that that was a considerable boon for British archaeology. Yeah. Hmm. We actually have a question which I think goes quite well with what we were just speaking about. Thank you, Angela. Okay. How big of a problem is looting? And has one of your excavations been affected by it? For example, over the weekend or on the days people would come and destroy it or take fines from it? Uh, I remember your stories actually about that. We we've never had an um, individual problem with the site where stuff has been taken. We have had material the sites damaged when we haven't been there for a considerable amount of time. Uh, but that may have been weather or or other other maritime activity. There used to be a huge problem in the UK with the casual souvenir collecting from wreck sites, largely taken from the wrecks of two world wars because Britain is inundated with shipwrecks from, from the two world wars and the, the removal of material from them um, was, was commonplace th 30 years ago. It's not so much now. Um, and the, the, there is a whole legal procedure to go through it if you do that. There also used to be a problem with the commercial salvage of archaeological sites where people would um, would decide that there was a fortune in gold on a shipwreck um, and get people to invest in them and then go out and dig it up and usually not find anything or um, vastly exceed the costs of the material that they recovered. Um, but really with the the license of any marine activity in the UK now, that's gone because in order to do anything on, on the seabed in the UK, out to 200 miles, you have to have a license and that has, has to have an archaeological assessment before it's granted. So it did used to be a problem. Uh, the casual, you're always going to get people taking things from shipwreck sites, but the days when it was commonplace, I think it disappeared over here anyway. Yeah, so it's the same in, in Egypt with 
um, during the, the last 20 or 30 years, there is a lot of uh, souvenir hunters who just casually going for a dive and then they, they are diving on a shipwreck and then they decide to take a souvenir with them. Um, so yeah, that, that, that's ha happened a lot. And I think it's still happening. Um, it's also under the radar because a lot of um, diving uh, centers, uh, the, we have hundreds of diving centers across the country um, and um, people would end up looting some of the, uh, some, uh, some kind of archeological um, objects, uh, either all because we have some shipwrecks dating back to um, uh, medieval age, so um, some uh, 17th century, 16th century, 18th century, and also we have a lot of a variety of Second World War uh, ships in Egypt and, and modern uh, shipwrecks, especially in the Red Sea, um, where most of the diving activity is happening. Um, also, we would, we sometimes would have reports from fishermen and um, around um, Alexandria who would catch something in their nets um, by chance. Um, some people would just throw it back into the water and some people would keep it. Um, and then they would say, how much would, would this get me if I sell it um, and things like that. Um, but we don't have much of um, salvaging operations um, at all in Egypt because everything has to go, again, has to go through the Ministry of Antiquities. Any kind of underwater archaeological work has to go to the, through the Ministry of Antiquities. Uh, so it's more, it's kind of legalized uh, and really strict uh, with this. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, sorry, sorry no, just, Tasha, go on. Oh. No, I was just going to say, going on from what Zihad was saying, there's a question in from Simple Archaeology. Hello, Simple Archaeology. And they were asking, you know, how have commercial diving companies, or do, sorry, do commercial diving companies create problems for underwater heritage with regards to damage and theft? Now, you mentioned earlier about how there are a lot of, there's a lot of diving institutes across Egypt. And you did yeah. mention that potentially, but if they were to get caught, in doing this yeah they would be in jail uh, they will go to jail um, um, because now we have an, an amendment to the national uh, law of, uh, of antiquities in Egypt uh, that was issued last year and this amendment increases the penalties against anybody who um, uh, do any kind of looting of antiquities either on land or underwater um, so they would go directly to jail for one year at least, um, and a penalty of one million Egyptian pounds um, at least also. So, so there is, the law is there, uh, but again, there is some minor salvaging. What we, what, we, what we try to do is we raise the awareness of the diving community in Egypt and trying to um, involve them within our work and um, uh, explaining to them what we do and also do some outreach. Um, and also because we have a lot of friends in the community, in the diving community, so we talk to each other, we go for uh, fun diving in, in, in the Red Sea, so we talk a lot. And this is the only way of uh, dealing with, with this is um, making sure that everybody understand the value of this heritage and the value of this of these antiquities. And then they would come to appreciate it more because then they can bring in tourists uh, to dive on the sites. Uh, some of the sites are open for tourists. So all the Second World War um, shipwrecks and all the modern um, uh, shipwrecks are open for, for the divers. Uh, but some of the, the more ancient shipwrecks are not open um, for diving. Um, so, yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's, a big, it's a big problem and it will always be there um, because there is a lot of people involved with it. Uh, but we hope that it will, it will be reduced by 
dealing with these guys and also uh, outreaching to them and uh, telling them what's right and what's wrong uh, about doing this. Yeah, it, it, it used to be a big problem in, in the UK and there were a number of things that stopped it really. One was um, education and outreach. Again, it was talking to people and demonstrating the, the value of it and courses being run by people like the Nordic Archaeology Society as a way of educating people. I think also society moved on and it used to be really exciting in the 70s to teach things from shipwrecks and it's not seen as um, a good thing to do now and I think also people realise that you remove something, you destroy part of the site um, and then after three years your, your wife or your husband wants you to get rid of it because the stinking pile of rubbish in the corner um, of the garage is, is, is no use to man nor beast really so I think um, so I think people got a greater appreciation of shipwrecks and they could see what had happened to sites that had been uh, cleaned of portable material in the 60s, 70s and the 80s. And outreach and education played a big part of it. And in the last 10 years, people have gone to prison for this activity as well and suffered serious fines. So a combination of outreach, the change of society um, and also enforcement as well. Um, has made a big difference. And whilst we know material is still recovered, it is nowhere near as commonplace as it used to be. Um, you know, so, yeah, so it's the, the, the world's moved on a bit. Mm. And there's another question actually on YouTube. By the way, anybody watching on Instagram, please head over to YouTube. The link is in the bio where you can be sending in your questions. Yeah, so there's a question on YouTube regarding how do, are you able to manage working underwater without disturbing the natural habitat? Thank you, Barbara, for that question. Um, there's going to be disturbance because you're removing bits of the seabed, um, but you reinstate that seabed afterwards. And in my experience of sites, they're colonised fairly soon, within 12 months of you, of you leaving them. So there is an impact on... Uh, on marine life that is attached to the surface of material um, because you're, you're removing the substrate on which they live. But on other parts of the site that you're not touching, it's still there. In, in other parts of the, of, the, of the similar sea area, it's still there. What you do tend to find is that you get a lot more fish when you're excavating because you're um, digging into the seabed and you're creating food for them. So... There's an impact. Uh, it tends to restore itself, and uh, that, that's. Um, but it's minimal. If you think of the area for even a large excavation of a shipwreck, wouldn't recover more than fifty or hundred square meters of seabed. So it's very small. Hmm. So you had anything to add? Yeah. So the the, the impact would be very minimum. Um, it depends again on the site and uh, the mission of the, uh, uh, of the archaeological mission. Um, so if, if it's just for, um, normally it would be only um, uh, digging up sections of the seabed and then again backfilling it at the end of the season for the next season. And sometimes the, um, the, the archaeological remains would be concreted in a block of uh, um, of big underwater or sea corals, so you cannot you cannot actually move them because they are part of the coral. So you just study them in situ um, without any disturbance to to them. Um, so yeah, so actually you know archaeology is a destructive method, uh, but we tend to not to disturb. Um, the environment, um, even if we do some disturbance of the environment, we would do again backfilling of the of the site, and um, as they mentioned, it would be regenerated again within a few months. Yeah, I think it's important to note as well that most archaeology, ninety percent of it or more, is merely survey, which has no more impact on a site than sports diving does. So, you know, the excava whilst excavation has an impact on the seabed, it's a, in the UK at least, it's a very rare occurrence. 
so most archaeological activity has virtually no impact whatsoever on, on anything because you're not all you're doing is swimming around and photographing it or measuring it. Hmm. Which brings me on to our next question. What type of equipment are you using to conduct maritime archaeological excavations or as you said, surveying? Because I'm sure there's so many different aspects of conducting maritime archaeological projects as there is on land. I can imagine it's the same. Um, we use um, the majority of things that you use on land, but we don't use wheelbarrows and uh, we don't use shovels so much. We use trowels and brushes and everything else. And we use, um, this is for excavation rather than survey, and we use, you know, we use cameras and measuring tapes and all the other things. We use uh, water dredges or airlifts to remove spoil, uh, which is a way of moving the spoil around underwater to get it off off the site. Um, so really, it's not completely unrecognisable from a terrestrial site in that a lot, a lot of the measuring equipment, a lot of the actual digging equipment is very similar and stuff ends up in plastic bags, in boxes on the surface, just the same as it would on a, on a terrestrial site. You know? So it's, it is very similar, having worked a lot on terrestrial sites. There, there, there is not a huge difference between them. It's, it's mainly the, the environment is, is different. Hmm. Has he had anything to add? Yeah. So, the, the, as David said, uh, the environment is different. So, that requires some a bit of modification to the main equipment that we use on land. So, we can use the camera that we use it on the terrestrial site, but we have to put it in an, an underwater housing and fit it with an underwater lights to be operational underwater. And also, we'd have our own gear, which is um, Another adds another layer of com complexity to the to the to the underwater work um, because we are limited. Uh, we don't have the whole day uh, underwater. We have only a few minutes, um, maybe a couple of hours uh, every day underwater. While on terrestrial uh, terrestrial side, we can work all day long as long as there is sun. So there is this is this is the main the main uh, difference between terrestrial archaeology and underwater archaeology. Um, and also, yeah, it's mainly it's the environment and everything around the environment. Hmm. So how would you prepare for an excavation? Um, do you, would you even class it as an, do you call it an excavation? Yes. Or is it a different term? Yeah. So how yeah. would you prepare for one? So normally, um, Normally, the, the things that we need to do first is do uh, test for all the diving equipment that have to be done on an annual basis. Um, all the equipment would be gone to the, to the uh, provider and then they were uh, do full test for um, uh, all the cylinders and all the uh, regulators and also for the, uh, the compressors, uh, the diving compressors. Um, so that's that's one thing that needs to be happening, uh, but the rest is the same as the terrestrial archaeology. You gather a team, you have your equipment, you you, you set up your base, and then you start your operation. Um, it's it's the same. Um, it's only the, the difference of the, the equipment and um, the maintenance of the equipment before going um, underwater. And also there is uh, the aspect of danger with we, you don't. You normally have a supervisor in, on a terrestrial site, but also in underwater archaeology, you would have a diving supervisor who supervises all the diving activities apart from the archaeological supervisor. So you have to have two supervisors work, working together, um, and sometimes they are both one person. But it's better to have a, a diving safety officer on the site. Uh, to keep an eye on uh, all the activities, all the diving activities happening um, and make sure that um, um, everyone is safe uh, during the work underwater because this is the main uh, issue with underwater archaeology is safety. Uh, you have to you have to have to be really safe because sometimes you would be carried away in your digging underwater, you forget the time and then 
you end up with um, a diving accident, for example. So you don't have to, you don't, you don't want to, to have this on an archaeological mission. Uh, that's why you would have a, a safety diving uh, officer um, on site, making sure that everyone is working in a safe condition. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree. The bigger the, uh, it's it, the same as a terrestrial excavation, except you're you're bringing diving and working from boats into it with with all of the the safety issues that 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 brings to it. You know, and, and as long as those are managed right, there's there's no very little chance of um, of incidents. In fact, we we've I can't think of one that we've had, but that, that is a, a logistically complicated thing to do because everything has to be serviced and in date and maintained and kept going which is quite a technical challenge in itself so that's the biggest difference the the only other difference i can think of most of the material that we recover um it tends to be bigger and it tends to need to be kept wet almost inevitably needs to be kept wet so it's it is a, a bit more complicated to uh, to deal with the arc with, with the material as it's recovered um but most of what what he's done, with the exception of the diving, is the same as a, a terrestrial site. You know, it's the environment is different, uh, the material can be different, and you're dealing with a, with a ship or a submerged terrestrial site rather than something out in the air. But everything would be familiar to somebody who who was used to archaeology. Hmm. I think we'll lighten the mood a little bit. <laughs> Let's get away from the danger. <laughs> But it's actually very true. Um, when you learn to dive and all the training process, you're constantly told, look, you need to check your oxygen tanks. You need to make sure that you're watching the time. And of course, buddy system. I can imagine it's the same. How many, like a minimum for an expedition, would you need divers wise? Would you have a minimum of four people or would you do the same? So buddy system of two. In the UK, you've got to have a, you've got to have a team size of at least four. And that could be two people in the water and two people on the surface if you're operating with scuba. If you're operating with surface supply, that's one person in the water and three people on the surface with a standby diver. Um, but if you're doing something large, obviously you, you need more people to work. Um, traditionally in the UK, you can't get more than 12 people onto, onto the kind of boats that we use because of the licensing provision of the boat. So we tend to have a team of 12 in that case, and you can have up to six people into the water, in, in the water at once, and then you, you rotate them through. The biggest issue is how fast can you fill their tanks to put them back in the water, if it's shallow, or if it's deep, the biggest constraint is, is the depth. Mm. Yeah. And Zihad, anything to add? Yeah, it's, 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 it's the same. We would normally go as in, in the the, the body system is always recommended. So we would normally have a, um, a pair of divers underwater, one standby diver, and one um, just for um, um, on, on the boat as a skipper. So we'd have four, the minimum is four, um, uh, but it can be more than four because it depends again on the site. So um, some of our sites, some of the sites that I've worked on uh, we would do uh, diving from the beach, so we would have six, eight, or ten uh, members going to different zones within the site, uh, diving from the beach uh, with um, a, a boat watching over them, um, all of them. But yeah, again, it depends on the um, the, the site itself. Um, and we have uh, another question from YouTube. Thank you, Barbara. She's asked, has there been any new finds recently? Any any big ones? In the last six months, let's say. Oh, God. Uh, <laughs> but you can think I can't of th the first one. I can't think of anything um, in the UK. I'm, I'm sure I'll be wrong in saying this, but I can't think of anything in the UK that's been found in the last six months. The last major thing I saw internationally was the discovery of the, I think, the USS Nevada which was a Second World War dreadnought battleship, which was sunk as part of the immediate, the Bikini Atoll nuclear trials. Mm. Zihad, what's the first uh, 
example that popped into your head? Well, we have, the, there is not much of the new discoveries, but we have same sites, but some new aspects of the site being uncovered. And then hence you get a sort of new discovery. Um, so there is a um, there is a French mission um, in collaboration with Oxford University and the Ministry of Antiquities that works um, 35 kilometers uh, east of Alexandria in Abu Clear Bay, and every year they find something new because uh, they are uh, conducting underwater um, um, work on two ancient cities, Canopus and Heraklion. Um, in um, in Abu Kir Bay, which is east of Alexandria, and every year they find something new. Um, so there is there is always something new, kind of new, uh, but major discoveries, nothing yet. Um, um, most of the missions that are working underwater in Egypt, they are a handful of missions. There is not much happening, uh, but um, hopefully we'll have something big soon um if we can go back to water to, to water after this the the quarantine that we are under uh, this has definitely affected a lot of people quarantine yeah yes. yeah we, we, were, we we had we i had to cancel two uh missions uh, in the last month um in the red sea um due to the the virus outbreak um yeah yeah we've had the same we've cancelled um to date three small projects and i can see others going that way as well we've moved one biggish one into next year S some of them we can move into next year some of them we can't you know, but at the moment we we've just been given the go-ahead to dive to shore dive in the uk now which is very limited and wouldn't allow us to work on any of our our sides um so yeah it's a bit frustrating really we should have been at sea and this time last year we were we were at sea now but you know this is life we can't do anything about it unfortunately but what are both of your most memorable or favorite maritime archaeology projects or discoveries or artifact um for me it's a site i've worked on all sorts of sites of all sorts of periods from um, from the Mesolithic up to the um, up to the Second World War over the years. But my favourite one is one that's come in and out of my life for the last 25 years, which is a small shipwreck in Alderney in the British Channel Islands, which is which are actually off the coast of France. And it's a vessel that sank in the 1590s, a small private English warship carrying troops that were probably coming from an English army in uh, what's now the Netherlands into Brittany. And the wreck itself contains, there's none, none of the ship left or very little of the ship left. But what is there is the weapon system of the, of the vessel. And this is the weapon system that England deployed against the Spanish Armada. And it's the only example of that. Um, but also all the, the troops equipment and stores are on board everything from their personal cook, cooking equipment to their armaments. And it's from a really, purely from a UK point of view, a really exciting period in Britain's maritime history. Um, it's quite a challenging site to dive and it's a, a nice part of the world. And I've been going there off and on for 25 years now. So that's my, Elizabethan shipwreck in Alden is my personal favorite. Yeah, for, for me, we, um... One side that I was supposed to be diving this month, actually, in the Red Sea, um, southern of Hurghada, it's, it's called the Sadana Island shipwreck. And it's an 18th century uh, shipwreck that was excavated in the 90s by the Institute of Nautical um, Archaeology, uh, the AINA, um, uh, in Egypt uh, between 1990 and 1996. Uh, and we did a revisit of the site uh, two years ago to check on the condition of the site and trying to do an assessment of it. It's, a, it's a, an Ottoman shipwreck that's um, 
on about 30 to 40 meters of water. So it's, it's a really deep um, site. It's a really challenging site. Um, and we were looking forward to go and, and do some assessment, more assessment this year, but sadly, um, the, yeah, the virus had something to say about it. Um, and it was uh, bringing a lot of cargo from uh, the Indian Ocean, um, a lot of Chinese porcelain, um, um, clay pipes, um, and also um, coffee and spices. Um, and it was bringing it up to Egypt and then from Egypt to, um, uh, to the Ottoman Empire, to Istanbul. Um, and it, it was wrecked there um, about 30 kilometers uh, south of Borgada. Um, and it's really, really interesting site. Uh, a lot of the material was uh, brought up by divers by the mission in the 90s, and uh, they, they are being conserved from the 90s until now. Some of them are uh, now on display on the new museum of Orgada, um, which was supposed to be open also this quarter, but sadly it's, it's, it's on a lockdown. But hopefully after this situation, people can go and visit. Um, the the exhibition in the museum. Um, it's really really interesting uh, site, and I'm looking forward to go back again in the near future. Well, fingers crossed yes. for you. <laughs> um, just a little reminder: anybody on Instagram, please head over to YouTube as the live stream will be ending shortly, as we are nearing the one hour mark. So please head over to YouTube, and the link is in the bio. Anyone who is watching, please get your questions ready. Whilst I'll ask them something else, think of anything you'd like to write, please send them in now. So I do have a question. No pressure, but there is a lot of pressure on this answer. What would you say to any aspiring maritime archeologist? Any student, somebody who wants to study it? Um, my advice would be, I get, go and get a degree in archeology. span get plenty of practical experience when you're doing that degree um, and then look for a master's program somewhere but in the middle of that learn to dive and get plenty of diving experience maritime archaeology isn't all about diving and there are people in the game that that don't dive but being able to dive gives you complete access to all of the material so it's education experience and persistence yeah, I, would, I would say the same as, as what Dave said. Um, yeah, getting a diving qualification is the, the utmost thing to do. And getting more experience in diving before, before diving into maritime archaeology and getting education um, is a key aspect. Uh, some people start uh, education in maritime archaeology and then start diving. Um, uh, but I would recommend that the diving would start first uh, because that would take time um, and a lot of effort to get used to working underwater before uh, getting the, the education. But yeah, mainly get some um, nice background reading about the, the topic um, and then go do some diving and then yeah, apply for a master's uh, in maritime archaeology somewhere in the world. And we actually have another question kind of to do with uh, being a student from Angelina. Thank you, Angelina. She's asked, what is the biggest problems for training people at university in maritime archaeology? Or aren't there any? Um, from my perspective, as somebody that has, uh, it is the cost of providing fieldwork opportunities. For people. If you go back to our question at the very beginning about how much does this, is, does this all cost, it costs a lot of money and um, creating those opportunities is very difficult for people. So to give somebody reasonable practical experience is very expensive and that's the hardest challenge for, for as an educational organisation. Mm. I can imagine. Do you have anything to add? Yes. 
I think okay. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and let's see. Oh, oh! Somebody has asked, who is the most famous archaeologist in maritime archaeology in the past and present? That's a hard one. There's lots of them. George Bass, who was the the founding father of it all, or Colin Martin, who was the founding father in the UK. But those would be my my two guesses. Yeah, I would say definitely George Bass. Um, Honor Frost, and currently also um, we have big names like John Adams, um, and yeah, we have a lot of really good underwater archaeologists around the world now. It's a small community, but it's getting bigger, and hopefully we'll get more enthusiast archaeologists into the field in the near future. If they want to dive, that is. I know, as you said before, there's there's two ways, but yeah, you can you, you can join you can join if you are not a diver, and then um, um, it's easy. But again, as Dave said before, it, it gives you the opportunity or opens the, the door to go and dive and do the actual work uh, by hand. But but normally we spend a day underwater versus ten days. On the, in the desk, analyzing all the data that we gathered in this one day. So you have a lot to do um, uh, in your office, more than other Yeah, yeah. It, it, it isn't just all about diving. Yeah, Diving is part of it, you know, and there are opportunities for people who are, who are divers to work with archaeologists and a lot of the people that we use um, aren't professional archaeologists, but they are professional divers. Um, but in terms of doing the archaeology, it's not all about diving. Diving is enjoyable, it's fun, and you, you get to see things, but the majority of the work is away from diving. And that's the... For some people, that's a disappointment, but, I mean, it's the reality. It's the same as when we're reality. talking... Yeah. It, it, it's exactly the same when we're, we're on site and people ask us, do we get to analyze the finds, look at them in more depth? And being a field archaeologist, you're like, no, I don't really have time to, to look at them and maybe um, compare them to other sites nearby because that's not my role. My role here is just to excavate as fast as I can in the time I've got. So unfortunately, there is a lot of uh, there's a lot of things that we don't get to do that we would like to do. Uh, we do have, I'm just gonna check to see if there's more questions coming through with all my devices. Let's see. They've been going on for an hour, by the way. It's amazing once you start talking about maritime archaeology, all the questions start rolling in. Let's see. We can spend the whole day talking about it. You could. <laughs> you do a few conferences as well at this rate. Let's see. Dum, dum, dum. Ah. Earlier you mentioned, Zihad, about how you focus on rivers more so. In more depth, could you go? What exactly is your research area? So my research is about traditional sailing boats on the Nile. Um, so I'm doing more of a, an ethnographic approach to um, the ethnographic side of maritime archaeology. So going to the uh, community who are dealing with boats uh, on the Nile, especially specifically sailing boats on the Nile, um, and trying to understand how they are working with these boats and um, their ideas and how they used to build it, and also how the the change happened within the last 200 years. So my focus is the last 200 years in Egypt on the Nile um, regarding regarding um, boats. Uh, so boat construction, use of boats, and also rigging and sailing, and how they used to um, do all of this. Hmm. That sounds very cool. And if anybody's interested in learning more about Zihad's research, if there is enough interest, maybe we could do a another live stream talking okay. about Nile river boats. Yeah, that'd be very cool. Let's see if people are interested in that. You can give a thumbs up on the video description box. 
So, I think, gents, it's been an absolute pleasure, but it seems everybody is, is definitely content with how we have been dealing with the questions. So thank you for both of you for joining today. Okay, thank you. And thank you. if anybody who is watching, if you have any questions, please put them in the description box. If we have enough, then we could always come back and do a Q&A session. So thank you so much for joining. It's been an absolute pleasure. Until next time, see you, YouTube. I'm going to go. There we go. Bye, YouTube. <laughs>